So Interrupted and Inconvenient Savior, that's the title of our Advent series as we prepare for Christmas. Interrupted. That comes from a Latin word that literally means a royal pain in the neck. Interrupted. The root also can be translated as to break up, break apart, break into pieces. We get another word from that same Latin root, and that is to rupture. And that is exactly what interruptions do. They break up our expectations. They break apart our plans. They come into our lives and say, you thought it was going to be that way, but really it's going to be this way. Interruptions are often frustrating, irritating, often challenging. And we kind of do all we can to avoid them. Question, look back on your life, and wouldn't you say that many of the very best parts of your life actually are there because of some kind of interruption? I know that God interrupted my life when I was a senior in high school, I'd been accepted at Rice, pre-med, had this life planned out, and then God interrupted my life by calling me into the ministry. And I am really glad that he did, because there's nothing as fulfilling for me as when someone tells me that God has used me in their life to help them accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, or to grow closer to him, or find some kind of healing. I'm really glad God interrupted my life in an unexpected way. My life was interrupted when I was a senior in college, and I fell in love with Peggy Lynn Carl. The life that I had foreseen, the life that I had planned out for myself as an international playboy, all came crashing down. Me and Jethro Bodine. Anybody remember? Okay, boomer. Me and Jethro Bodine. Uh... That was a really good interruption. All of my plans of being an international playboy were taken away, but also all of my feelings of being alone and unwanted and a total geek were taken away as well. My life was interrupted about 18 years ago. A man came and said, Rob, we're so glad you're here at the church. We need to start a men's ministry. I got a great idea. And he began to describe a men's ministry just like what my father's generation had had. Uh, we're going to cook a breakfast once a month. It'll be flapjacks and sausage. And we'll bring in a speaker from the community. I thought, great, we're going to build a men's ministry cooking pancakes and bringing in somebody to talk about stuff that nobody's concerned with. Great. Uh, And I thought, "I I am not going to get invested in that. I'm not even going to interrupt a single Saturday morning once a month for that. And so I looked at him and I said, you know, your idea... It's a really great idea. It's a one, and you should go out and do it. And you guys let me know how it turns out. You don't need me for that. Go get them, Tiger. A couple months after that, a guy came in and said, Rob, I want to tell you a story. A guy I knew well in our church, he said, there's a guy we used to have in our church. He'd come a couple times every month. He came with his wife, his daughters, because they wanted him to. We had him in our services, but we never really did anything intentionally to grab him to help him grow closer to Christ. Uh, Over time, he became an alcoholic. It got so bad, his wife divorced him. His girls don't want anything to do with him. He used to be a vice president at a bank in Houston. Now he's homeless, living on the streets downtown. We had that guy in our church. We didn't do anything for him. I wonder how many other guys just like him are sitting in our pews on Sunday morning. I wonder what their lives will turn out to be. Here's what I think we ought to do. I think we need to start a men's ministry. I think some guys and I, once a week, we're going to cook a breakfast and you're going to talk to guys because I think maybe God can use you to reach them. And I remember thinking to myself, and I I thought to him, I I said, you realize I already have a full-time job, right? And this sounds like a lot of work. I'm pretty busy being the pastor of adult discipleship of a fairly large church. And that sounds like a lot of time. 
But I could not possibly think of a way to say no, because in his words, I heard the voice of God. So that was 18 years ago that we began Quest. It's grown to between five and 600 men. We meet on Sunday nights, Tuesday morning, 16 weeks out of the year. And men continue to tell me that they come to faith in Christ. They become better husbands, better fathers, better representatives of Jesus out in the world. And I'm not going to lie to you. When I'm doing quests, when I'm preaching, doing the other things that I do, it makes life um, kind of draining. And it also makes life an incredibly great blessing. See, I think we need interruptions. It's interruptions that give us an opportunity to grow closer to God, become more like Jesus, and do his work in the world. And in this series, Interrupted and Inconvenient Savior, we're looking how the coming of Jesus that first Christmas, how it interrupted people's lives and the difference that it made. Last week, we looked at Mary, the mother of Jesus. This week, we're looking at Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. And the coming of Jesus really disrupted his life in two ways. The first was disappointment. I'll make sense of that for you in just a moment. Look with me, Matthew 1.18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now talk about packing a lot of stuff in a single verse. In this one verse, we're told that Mary and Joseph were engaged. We're told that Mary becomes pregnant. We're told she becomes pregnant not by Joseph. She becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The child that she is to bear is to be named Jesus, and he will be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. That's a lot of info in one little verse. And Mary and Joseph being engaged in the first century in Judaism, that was a very formal relationship. The couple, they did not live together. They did not have intimate relations, but they were considered married. And the only way to break off that relationship was to go through a formal divorce process. So we're told a lot, but I still have questions that this verse doesn't. How was Mary found to be with child? And once it was found, how was it conveyed to her family? And how did they react? And, and how was it conveyed to Joseph? And how did he react? What did he say? What did he do? How did he feel? There's a lot of information I would like to find out. Now, one thing that's clear is that at this part of the story, Joseph either is not told that the child it is conceived by the Holy Spirit, or he doesn't believe it. And why would he? Hey, I'm engaged to you. I'm having a kid. God did it. That's a little hard to believe, right? That's where we are in the story. Look with me. Matthew 1.19. Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her Mary to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. So Joseph believes that his beloved, the woman he's engaged to, the woman he's looking forward to spending the rest of his life with, has been unfaithful to him, has cheated on him. Talk about a disappointment. I mean, really, that's not a strong enough word, is it? Disappointment. He would have felt more than disappointment. He would have felt betrayed. He would have felt humiliated. He would have felt his heart breaking. It would have been devastating to him. I've gone twice with someone, a man and a woman. I've gone twice with someone who is going to confess to their spouse that they've been unfaithful. And it was horrible. The pain that you saw within another human being, the weeping, the groaning, the sounds that come out of the body of someone who discovers that the one they love has been unfaithful, it is absolutely devastating. And that is exactly where Joseph is in this story. You ever been disappointed? You ever been betrayed? You ever been humiliated? 
you ever see all your dreams, all your plans come crashing down at your feet, not because of something you did, but because of something that someone else did? That's exactly where Joseph is in this story. How does he respond? Well, let's look at what we're told again. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. Now, first we're told that Joseph is a righteous man. He was a good and decent man. He took his own spiritual life seriously. The best he could, he walked in the ways of God. He had high standards for himself. Look at what the rest of the verse tells us. It says, Joseph was unwilling to expose Mary to public disgrace, so he planned to dismiss her quietly. Now, in the time of Jesus, there were two procedures for divorce. One was very public. Public charges would be made known. Everybody would know what those charges were. If it was adultery, it opened up the person who had committed adultery to being stoned to death as execution. We said last week that wasn't carried out often in the time of Jesus. But even if it was not, there was, and in this case it would be for Mary, there would be this stigma, this shame, this guilt that would be attached to her for the rest of her life. There was another procedure, a more private, a more quiet way of divorcing someone. And that could be done in the presence of as few as two witnesses. Nobody else would have to know. And then perhaps some cover story could be concocted that would protect the woman's life and protect her dignity and give her a chance to have some kind of life in the future. And this is what Joseph chooses. Think about that. He's been devastated. His heart is broken. And what flows out of that broken heart is compassion and concern for the person who wounded him. This is remarkable. What drives him is not his pain. What determines what he does is not what Mary did, what he believes she did. What moves him to action is not anger or bitterness or vengeance. What moves him to action is his concern for her well-being. This is really an incredible thing that Joseph does. When we go through periods of devastation, betrayal, pain, being wounded, these times they mark us, they define us, they make us who we are, they make us, they break us. In my second book, A Way Through the Wilderness, I talk about these times of devastation and hurt and confusion as wilderness periods. And and I say that when you go through a wilderness period, you always come out, but you don't come out the same. You never do. You come out bitter and broken and further away from God, or you come out more whole, more like Jesus, and more ready to be a blessing to others than you ever would have been. And what determines how we come out of that wilderness is the choices that we make. There's a really great little movie called Wonder. I don't know if you've ever seen it or not. It came out in 2017. It's on Amazon Prime, I believe, if you want to watch it. If you haven't seen it, I recommend that you do. But there's a beautiful line there, and it says, When given the choice between being right and being kind, choose kind. Joseph was a good and righteous man. Listen to me. Part of being a good and righteous person is choosing kind. It's choosing mercy. It's choosing compassion and forgiveness. Now, you don't have to choose that. You can choose anger and bitterness and vengeance. You can choose to hold on to your pain and hold on to your anger. You can choose to put your life on hold and not move forward. You can choose to stay right where you are, demanding an answer, an apology, someone somehow to make things right, for them to admit you were right and the other person was wrong. You can do all of that. You can decide to drink your feelings away or drug them away. You can decide to crawl up into a little ball, crawl into a deep, dark hole, and stay there. You can choose that. 
and your life will never be what it could have been. Or you can choose mercy and kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. Well, Rob, I can't, I can't just choose the way I feel. I didn't say you could. I said you can choose kind if you, if you don't feel kind. You can choose mercy even if you don't feel merciful. You can choose compassion even if you don't feel compassionate. Well, you don't know what he did to me, okay? But I know what you're doing to yourself. I know what you do to yourself when you hold on to your anger. I know what you do to yourself when you refuse to forgive. I know what you do to yourself when you let bitterness poison your soul. And I know what it does to the people around you. And I don't want that for you. And your way out, your way up, your way to freedom is to choose kindness, mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. Now, I'm not telling you to act like nothing happened. I'm not telling you to get back into a dysfunctional relationship. I'm not telling you that you need to get close to someone who has been abusive towards you so you can be abused again. That's not spiritual. That's stupid. Okay? But I am telling you that your way out is to choose kindness. It may simply be deciding I'm never going to speak ill of that person again. It may be I'm going to pray for that person. I'm going to wish that person well in my spirit. It may be God, I want to wring his neck, but I pray, help me begin the process of forgiveness. You may not be able to do it all at once, but you can take small steps. And what that will do is that it will make you more like Jesus It will bring you closer to God. It will make your life right and full. And it will get you in that place where God can use you again to be a blessing to others. Disappointments come into our life. Betrayal, disloyalty, pain, wounds, unfairness, they all come into our lives. They interrupt our lives and often in devastating ways. But there's a way out. Choose kindness, mercy, compassion. Now, I think that the coming of Jesus also interrupted Joseph's life in another way. And I think it it was that Joseph must have been overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the responsibility that he was given. Let's go back. Let's look at Matthew 1, 20 and 21. We're just continuing the story. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So Joseph finds out Mary has not betrayed him. She has a child. Joseph, you're going to raise this child. He's God's son. This is who you are now in charge of. This is your responsibility, raising the child of God. He must have been absolutely overwhelmed. I'm not capable of this. I'm not worthy of this. I don't know that I want this job. I can relate to that. I just remember bringing home my first normal kid, human kid. And that was scary, right? Do you remember this? I, re- I can remember Methodist Hospital downtown. They're strapping this little six pound, 13 ounce thing in the back of my car. And it looks like they're going to let me drive off with him. I haven't passed a test. I haven't taken a license. Nobody's checked out to see if I know what to do next. And off you go. Nice little lady in a pink outfit. Off you go. It's crazy, man. There's so much that I feel overwhelmed by. You know, just so many things I'm not capable of. Honest to God, if you could not make a living by loving Jesus and speaking about him in public, I'd be out on a street corner with a sign and some lame excuse why you ought to put money in a cup. That's how I would have to get by. This is a a true story. It happened about two months ago. I was on a plane. I am seated by myself in the exit aisle. Nightmare scenario for me. I, people are, are getting them. I am like staring for like 10 minutes in case of emergency. Is it, I can't figure out what's going to happen. I know I can't. 
the flight attendant, she comes by and says, uh, sir, you are in an exit row. Do you feel comfortable with the responsibilities? No, I do not. I do not feel comfortable with the responsibilities of being in the exit row. She said, excuse me. I said, look, I don't mind dying, but I don't think the people around me should have to die just because of me. She, she says, sir, we don't need to talk like that. Nobody's going to die here. I said, look, I'm just saying I'm a mechanical moron. I know this. I, I know Jesus, so I don't mind if I die, but other people sh on this plane should not have to die just because I'm an idiot. She says, uh, sir, you might feel more comfortable in another... Yeah, exactly, that's what I'm telling you. I would feel more comfortable in another seat. Got upgraded. Got upgraded, man. <laughs> From now on, I am choosing exit row every time. <laughs> I'm gonna write a blog, how to hack the airlines, man. So there are all these responsibilities, and it's like too much at times. And I think Joseph, that's exactly how he must have felt. This is crazy. This, I, this is too much for me. But many of our response of our interruptions, that's exactly what they are. They are interruptions that demand responsibility. Be responsible for your choices. Be responsible for your obligations. Be responsible to another person. Be responsible for doing something hard. Be responsible for making some part of the world a better place. And sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming. I don't know about gals. I think boys growing up, I think they believe I'll become a man when I get my life to the place that I'm free to do whatever I want to do. That's what a man is. Somebody who's just free to do what he wants. No one can tell him what to do. He doesn't have to do anything. He's gotten himself to that place financially. Otherwise, he can do what he wants to do. That does not make you a man. That makes you a 16-year-old boy who's never grown up. A man is someone who fulfills his responsibilities. It means you can be a man at 12 years old. An adult, male or female, is someone who accepts their responsibilities. And that's what interruptions do very often. They come in and they make us responsible for something. And often there are things we don't want to be responsible for, but we have to be responsible for now let's go back to Joseph. So he's responsible for raising God's child so that he, he becomes a man of God. And, and we don't read a lot about Joseph, but here we read, look with me, Luke 2, 41. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. So Passover was the celebration of the night that God delivered the Jews from bondage in Egypt. And it was really the defining moment in the life of Israel. And it was the duty of every father to take his family to Jerusalem for the Passover. And there at that festival, uh, people would be reminded, his family would be reminded, this is who God is. This is what God has done for us. This is who we are. This is what we are to do for God. This is what it means to be in the world as one who believes in Yahweh. And this is how we please him. Now, in our culture, we tend to think of children's spiritual lives as something that the wives, the moms are supposed to be in charge of. And we know that if it wasn't for godly mothers, many of our kids would never get any much spiritual input. But this responsibility for raising our kids in the faith, that's not sloughed off on mothers in the Bible. It's put squarely on the laps of dads. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. So I'm going to talk to men for just a minute, then we'll bring it back to everybody. So guys, your kids are going to be greatly influenced by your example in every area of their lives and spiritually as well. They're going to look at you and they're going to figure out if spirituality, if church, if having a real relationship with Jesus, is that something for girls and women or is that something also for boys and men? And is a relationship with Jesus, is that coming to church and kind of tipping your hat to the, quote, man upstairs once a week? Or is that something that really defines us and tells us how to walk in this world? 
Is it something that we talk about but we don't really act on or is that something that, that forms us and shapes us, that forms and shapes our values and how we treat others and how we treat the poor and how we do what's right even when it's costly and how we're faithful to what God has revealed even when it goes against the values of our culture. And guys, your sons are going to look to you and say, I guess that's what a man is. And you'll either set a godly example or you will give your son permission to live for himself and be like everyone else. And your daughters are likely to look at you and say, oh, so that's what a man is. That's what I should look for in a man. And you will either set a high bar that says, sweetheart, you deserve a man of integrity and character and who loves you and who loves Jesus? Or are you going to tell her to settle for something much less? Now, I know that some of us, men and women, we don't feel comfortable talking about our faith much. I get that. Some of us, we're just kind of growing in our own faith, and so it feels not quite right to start acting like we know all this stuff and telling our kids this stuff. So if that's you, I'm going to help you. And this is really parents, grandparents. So one thing I would encourage you to do if your children are really young, infants, toddlers, just start praying. Go in the room every night and say a prayer out loud for them. If you have grandkids, they come and see you do the same thing. You'll say, well, that doesn't really make any sense because my, my kids are so young, they won't even know that I'm praying for them. That's good news. It means you've got two or three years to practice before they figure out you don't know what you're doing. This is good training for you. All they'll know from the earliest age is that my dad, my mom, comes into my room and takes my hand or holds me close and speaks words that are soothing and calming and that make me feel loved. And then as they get older, continue to pray with them and then get a children's Bible. It'd make a good present for some of your kids. And then when you're with them, each night, read the part of that Bible and you'll give the message to your children, God's word really matters. And my dad, my mom, they think it's important. And as they get even older, I've shared this resource with you before, but I still love it. It's the Did You Know Children's Devotional book. There's three of them. We have them in our bookstore. We also, you can get them on Amazon. But they start off with a really interesting question that will kind of make a kid want to listen. Why is it that the buttons on a boy's shirt are on the different side than the buttons on a girl's shirt? And after it talks about that, it ties in a biblical passage, a little story, and it gives you a prayer. That would be really cool to do that with your kids. With your, wouldn't it be wonderful if your kids could not remember a night that you didn't pray with them? Just that was a part of their life. And as they get even older, this is a shameless plug, but somebody's going to teach your kids uh, about what it means to be a Christian in our culture. And a good book, I know I'm prejudiced, is the first book I wrote called The Trouble with the Truth. How do we be people who, who are motivated by love and compassion and at the same time be people who are committed to the truth that God has revealed? Our culture tells us you can't do both. The gospel says we can be great to say, let's both read a chapter, let's talk about it, let's do this over the next six weeks or so. Someone's going to teach your kids what it means to be a Christian. Why not you? Last thought, and we'll, we'll close up. After Jesus turns 12, we don't really hear much about Joseph. We read about his mom, we read about his brothers and sisters, but not about Joseph. And most scholars believe that Joseph was a good deal older than Mary. And so when Jesus was in his teens, or early 20s, uh, that Joseph died. And Mary and Jesus and the others were left alone. And in some ways that's kind of sad, because it means that uh, Joseph never really saw the man that Jesus became never saw the fruit of his investment in the life of Jesus. Never, never heard him preach that first sermon where he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. 
Never saw him heal the sick. Never saw him feed the hungry. Never saw him call out powerful men for their hypocrisy. Didn't see him when he was resurrected from the grave. Mary did, but, but not Joseph. So in some ways it's kind of sad, but there's also a word there for us. And that word is, tomorrow is not guaranteed to anyone, not even to the earthly father of Jesus. So you wonder, how many birthdays did Joseph have with Jesus? How many Christmases did Joseph have with Jesus? Um, There was one that was the last one. Didn't know it, but there was one that was the last one. So don't want to be more, but what, what if this was the last Christmas you had with your kids or your grandkids? Would you think, boy, we really ought to buy them a lot of stuff and make it the best Christmas ever? Or would you think, you know, I really need to uh, talk with my child about what's most important. I need to really ask them what's going on in their lives and how I can help them. I really need to tell them that I love them. What if you had one year left? There'll come a time when it'll be your last year. I have told you my father died a little bit over a month ago. So we've had our last Christmas. We've had our last year. Didn't know it, but we did. You almost never know it, but you do. If you had one year left, what would you do? Go on a mission trip with your child, maybe? Or go on some fun trip, just the two of you, where you have a chance to talk and you say, tell me about your life, tell me about your work, tell me where you struggle, what are you anxious about, and if I have something that might be helpful, maybe I'll say it, but I really just want to hear. I just want to tell you I'm proud of you. I love you. I think about you every day. I pray for you every day. What would you do if you had just one year left? Much more important than what we might do in the future is what we do today. And so I want to encourage you as this Christmas comes to think. Maybe, maybe it's asking your child to forgive you for something or writing down something to give him or her. But think about making this um, some real opportunity to fulfill this huge responsibility that you and I have of raising our children up to know our love and to know God's love too. So Joseph, Jesus interrupted his life first with a terrible disappointment that he handled so well and then with this immense responsibility. And he manned up and he handled that well also. I pray that God will Give us the grace to handle our disappointments and our responsibilities in the same way. Let's pray. Gracious God, we open our hearts to you, to what you have for us. Lord, I pray for those of us here who are struggling with some act, some event that has wounded them and hurt them, has brought some kind of devastation into their life. And Lord, we don't make light of that. We don't say that's some small thing. All of us have had that happen. We know how difficult it is to overcome. But I pray, Father, that those people right now, they would call out to you and say, Lord, begin to work in me. Free me from my anger. Free me from my bitterness. Free me from having to hold on. Free me from having to get an answer, an apology. Free me so that I can live again. Lord, help me to begin the process of forgiveness. Show me how I can do some little kindness, even if I don't quite feel it. Lord, I'll trust you that if you do what I say, you will change how I feel. So Lord, give people right now some little nudge. You're with them. You'll help them make this journey. You'll set them free if they'll just take one step forward. Lord, I pray for those of us who have great responsibilities. We think of family, but we also have them at work and in the lives of others. Lord, I pray that instead of being overwhelmed, we would turn these over to you. We'd say that all things are possible through faith. And Lord, we pray that we would believe we don't have to figure it all out. We don't have to be strong enough. We don't have to be wise enough. We just have to come to you and say, God, I want you to help me get through this because I want to do things right. 
Lord, I know that freedom's not doing whatever I want. I know that freedom is doing what you desire. And so I will trust in you. Whoever's struggling right now, feeling the weight of some great responsibility, Lord, tell them you are with them. This is an opportunity to grow and you will see them through. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.